Thank you very much for the very kind invitation to uh, come and uh, speak to you today. Uh, spring has arrived in New York. It's still a little cold in Toronto, so we don't have a lot of uh, green. Uh, so it's great to see Central Park so green. And it's lovely to be in this very, these very elegant surroundings today. I have, however, this uncontrollable urge to exercise. <laughs> I will, however, re uh, resist that as much as possible during the course of my presentation. So I was given the task of talking about uh, the topic of whether girls are protected from developing autism spectrum uh, disorder. I'm going to pepper my talk with some lovely artwork by uh, women who are artists uh, and also have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder as a reference really to the celebration of diversity and the topic of resilience. And I think girls with ASD bring up this issue of resilience, which is one of the themes of my presentation. These are my financial disclosures. This is the funding sources that I have. I should say as well that the Autism Science Foundation was very supportive in a paper that we recently did uh, uh, that was uh, uh, published on the baby sibs. So I really have just two objectives in this tight 10 minute presentation. Boy, it's hard to give a talk in 10 minutes. Uh, so I'm only limiting myself to these two questions. Are girls protected from developing autism spectrum disorder? And I think there's mounting evidence that suggests that they are. And I think the talk from John Constantino earlier provides some of the background for that. Uh, but then the next question is, if they are protected, what does it actually mean? And here, I have no clue. But I will make some proposals that I think are worth investigating. But first of all, it's really important for us to have an understanding of what it actually means to be protected. And that is that in the face of ASD risk factors, and I'm going to talk about or include both genetic and environmental risk factors, there are other factors that reduce the prevalence of the disorder or make it less severe. So it's really important to distinguish between protective factors and risk factors. A protective factor is not simply the absence of a risk factor. It's another factor. It's a different set of factors uh, that protects, reduces prevalence, makes less severe. So we can think about ASD as the result of multiple risk and multiple protective factors. This is the, this is the famous uh, uh, diagram that illustrates this. John uh, had a couple of these slides up as well. But here the idea is that uh, there's an increasing genetic liability to have an autism spectrum disorder. At one, and here's the number, the proportion of the population. There are some people in the population that have very few risk factors for the disorder. There are a lot of people that have some risk factors for the disorder. Then there are people that have a greater number of risk factors, both genetic and environmental. And there is a threshold beyond which one becomes affected by the disorder in the face of the accumulation of these different risk factors. And the idea that folks have been trying to uh, study is the concept that there might be different thresholds, that is a, a higher threshold to experience or to be affected by ASD if you're a female relative to a male. So this would explain the phenomena that there are in the sex ratio of ASD, which we've talked about <coughs> as being about four to one. So what is the evidence that girls are affected uh, with ASD? There's three really uh, lines of evidence that are coming together. The first is that the sex ratio varies with the severity of the phenotype, and I'll show you that data. The second is the possibility, this is less clear, that girls can carry the risk factor, the same risk factor that would affect a boy, but the girls themselves are not affected. And then thirdly, evidence that girls require a higher number of genetic risk factors to show ASD. So first, the sex ratio in ASD. Well, everybody knows that the sex ratio is between three and four to one, three and four boys to every girl. 
But there's accumulating evidence that girls have a slightly different phenotype and that our measurement tools are in fact male biased. Girls, if girls have a different phenotype, they may present differently. This is the, the so-called camouflage effect that people are beginning to wonder about whether that might occur in girls, whether they're, they're camouflaging their ASD symptoms in some particular way. Because of the male bias, girls are more likely to be diagnosed if they have a comorbid intellectual disability. So there's this assert what we call an ascertainment bias that explains the four to one uh, sex ratio. But girls with ASD, in the absence of intellectual disability, are not as well recognized as boys. And all the clinicians will tell you that a girl without in, with ASD symptoms, without an intellectual disability, is more difficult to diagnose than a boy. Now, some really interesting data is coming forward from the baby sib studies. If we look at the so-called broader autism phenotype, uh, in those baby sib studies in the unaffected siblings. And John, again, uh, uh, alluded to this. So if you look at the sex ratio in these unaffected sibs who have some autism symptoms, the sex ratio is not four to one. So our study, Georgiatis et al., 2013, we had equal number of boys and girls with this sub-threshold, very mild phenotype in the unaffected girls, or in the unaffected siblings, sorry. Some other studies, you can see the other studies that are listed there, they're not quite one to one, but they're certainly lower than the three and four to one that you see with affected status. The point being that the sex ratio gets smaller, more equal with this sort of sub-threshold um, condition. Isn't that lovely with the butterflies? And so female sex as a protective factor. Again, this is built on this multiple threshold model, what's called the Carter effect, that girls now require a greater genetic liability in order to cross that higher threshold in order to be affected. Well, if girls require this greater liability, girls who carry a genetic risk variant may be less likely to be affected with ASD, and the relatives of girls with ASD will be more likely to be affected than the relatives of boys with ASD, and we should see that girls with ASD carry a greater uh, burden of risk variance compared to boys with ASD. So this is an example of a pedigree. This story is way too good to be true, but it's really an excellent example of uh, the differential sex ratio in uh, pedigree. So this is a, a pedigree where we know what the mutation is. It starts with a grandfather up here who carries a, a deletion in a shank one uh, gene. This grandfather's a truck driver. He's a bit of a loner. Uh, he has a huge uh, stamp collection, uh, never really interacted with friends. Uh, he sadly has passed away, but we were able to get blood from him. He passes that genetic variant, the risk factor, to his daughter. His daughter, number two in the pedigree, uh, uh, is unaffected, but has significant anxiety. She passes that genetic variant only on to two of her children, this son, whom I know, who's a lovely, charming young man, definitely has Asperger's syndrome, and to her daughter, number, uh, number five there. The daughter, too, is unaffected with ASD, but she passes that genetic variant on to two of her sons, both of whom have an autism spectrum disorder. So here you can see the genetic variant is segregating through four generations, and at each generation, the female is unaffected, but the male is affected. Now we also, we, there is, although the evidence is conflicting now, there is uh, evidence more and more that the relatives of girls with ASD are at higher risk of being affected th with ASD than the relatives of boys with ASD. Because girls have a greater 
uh, genetic burden, their relatives will share that greater genetic burden, and therefore those relatives are more likely to be affected. And you know what? That data seems to be true. The next bit of evidence is a little conflicting, but it does look like these genetic variants are, when we're talking about inherited variants, not the de novo variants, but when we're talking about inherited genetic variants, they appear to go through unaffected mothers more frequently than going through unaffected fathers. And finally, I think there is more compelling, strong evidence that if you look at girls with ASD, they carry more risk variants than boys with ASD. Now, okay, so if there's evidence for these dif this differential threshold, what actually is it that protects girls? And here, there is a gaping hole in the evidence. We really have no idea about what the factors are that protect girls. We're learning what the risk factors are that affect boys and girls, but we have no idea about what it is that's pushing that threshold over to the right. We know that in typically developing boys, in typically developing children, there are sex differences in important uh, phenotypes that are risk factors for ASD. So girls have better empathy when they're growing up, better mentalizing abilities, they show more pro-social behavior. Girls in early childhood are ahead in terms of their language development. There's differential expression of genes in the brain, for example, um, and there's uh, a difference, differential growth of important brain networks that have been implicated in ASD. So in typically developing children, there are these important sex differences that might hold the key to what those protective factors are. So here's just an illustration from this great paper showing that uh, uh, there is this um, differential expression of genes in the brain, certainly in the prenatal period, that's biased uh, in the female population. And maybe some of those genes are what's contributing to this protective um, effect. Now, to me, one of the most exciting and important translational opportunities about studying the protective effect is that it puts a focus on resilience. Because what we're really talking about is that girls are resilient in the face of the ASD genotype. Resilience refers to a better than expected outcome in the face of risk factors. And I think that's what we're seeing with this female protective effect. There is enormous variation in the expression of ASD but there's very little understanding of what accounts for that variation. And I'm suggesting that maybe the factors that protect females also account for that variation uh, in the expression of ASD for the better developmental trajectories that we see in some kids, both boys and girls. So maybe we should be focusing on our research not only on the risk factors, but also the protective factors, what protects girls rather than what put boys at risk. And I know the Autism Science Foundation is taking a lead on this, and I applaud them for that. Is what protects girls also what accounts for that variation in severity among boys? And understanding those genetic factors that are protective, I think will lead to very useful translational advances that will lead to better outcomes for all kids with ASD. Thank you very much. <laughs>